lanes for traffic. This design stiffened the bridge. It solved the potential problem and added capacity. But for the builders, the design raised the stakes. Now they had to build the largest double-decker suspension bridge in history with no extra time to do it. First, the building site was leveled. The next step, build two mighty bridge towers to shoulder the enormous weight of the fully loaded structure. They went up like skyscrapers, each more than 60 stories tall. From these dizzying perches, heavy steel suspension cables would need to be hung to support the massive road deck. But the giant cables needed to be three feet in diameter and each weighed 15,000 tons. Because of their massive weight, the cables could not simply be assembled on the ground and then hoisted into place. Instead, bridge builders used an ingenious but risky technique. They built the massive cables in the air. Two spinning wheels shuttle several small strands at a time back and forth across the towers, each pass adding girth to the massive cables. Once the cables were secured in place, workers could tackle the final and most dangerous part of the job, installing the huge bridge decks. Each prefabricated section weighed a thousand tons and had to be hoisted from a barge on the water, 200 feet straight up. Starting at the center and working out toward the towers, builders painstakingly raised each deck section into place. Finally, five years after the project began, the bridge was complete. It was quite staggering to, to me and to others, I think, that we had constructed this, this monument, the sort of bridge to the future. The completion of the bridge and the tunnel provided the two crucial water links on the route from the city to its new airport. But those two links needed to be connected to each other. The project called for two brand new highways. The first, the Kwai Chung Expressway, would take traffic from the tunnel, six miles down the coast, all the way to the new bridge. Building it through the congested Kowloon Port District was like trying to arc a bridge over a raging river. To keep the port open and traffic moving, builders were forced to construct the new highway over an existing 15 lanes of traffic. And that wasn't all. To minimize traffic slowdowns, the construction crews could only work at night. Road crews raced to bolt together Hong Kong's first ever highway in the sky. Meanwhile, the other highway, the final link in the chain, was also under construction. This eight-mile road, called the North Lantau Expressway, would take traffic from the bridge to the airport. 
But this last leg also presented a major engineering challenge. The terrain where the highway was to go was made up of rocky, steep hills. So engineers came up with a novel solution. They decided to extend the coastline out into the bay by more than a half mile. The highway, rail, and the airport's power lines would travel over this newly created level corridor. Builders dumped more than 25 million tons of rock into the ocean. Enough stone to build a five-foot-high wall from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco. As a consequence of the, uh, the high level of activity, we actually crammed into four to five years, 10 to 15 years of work effort. When this final link was finished, the route would be complete. A brand new thoroughfare winding its way from the airport along eight miles of coastal highway across one of the world's longest suspension bridges. Over six miles of elevated highway through an underwater tunnel into downtown Hong Kong. And yet, it wouldn't be enough. The new route would be great for cars and trucks, but it would do nothing for the 2.4 million people who use the subway. So engineers decided to add an ultra high speed rail line. It was an historic first. Anywhere else in the world, you will find that, that the railway has been fitted in afterwards. So we had an opportunity to design a railway in conjunction with the design of the, of the airport itself. The new Airport Express would need a 15-acre station downtown. Hong Kong didn't have 15 feet. Planners were not to be denied. Engineers created 50 acres of new land in Victoria Harbor. In only two years, the new station rose out of the ground. A foyer to the distant airport. Here, passengers could gather check their bags onto their flights, and settle in for a 20-minute ride. Beneath the harbor, across the bridges, along the coast, and step off the train inside the world's largest passenger terminal. There was just one problem. there was still no passenger terminal. With only two years left on the ticking clock, construction finally began on the terminal complex. The plan called for the largest enclosed space in the world, more than a mile long. But as builders began,